So let's get started. So we are the Rotterdam blockchain community, uh, and I'm gonna get into exactly what we want to achieve. Uh, but first, uh, I'm gonna introduce the team. Andres Campo, myself, from Colombia. Uh, we got Milos Rakovic, right here. Uh, we got Joseph Bello, over there. Uh, these guys have done a lot of tremendous uh, good work to help this put this together, so. Uh, let's get into it. All right, so what is exactly the Rotterdam blockchain community? Why are we all here? So this is an educational platform that we are bringing together uh, with the Rotterdam Business School. Uh, the idea is to give you guys access to courses, resources. Uh, we wanna put seminars uh, like this one so everyone can come and listen directly from the, es the experts. Uh, we're gonna be doing workshops so people can apply their knowledge on blockchain. Uh, we're uh, currently working on a blockchain lab and what it is in reality is uh, for our students uh, right now we're doing our thesis in blockchain so if you are interested in learning if you want to share resources with us if you happen to be doing research on blockchain please come talk, talk to me or just message us on the Facebook group um, of course this is a networking opportunity for all of you guys uh, please uh, meet everyone and see how you can uh, keep the excitement going and this, we also want to be a bridge to the workforce. So, of course, there is many people, there is uh, many companies interested in blockchain, implementing the technology already, and we want to make sure that the people that is knowledgeable have access to internships and uh, job positions and things that they can work on with blockchain. All right, so today we have uh, Amini Rafi uh, with us. Uh, he's going to be talking briefly about blockchain, uh, why it's important, and we also have the guys from BTC that come here, uh, and they're also going to be talking about uh, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin Cash as well, and their tools, and their really cool wallet. Hello. What's going on? Um, just before I start, I want to know, like, if you've been in the space for more than six months, just please put your hand up so I can just gauge your level of knowledge. Okay, so most of you are quite new to the ideology of decentralization in terms of blockchain and other distributed ledgers. So that's quite good because we can kind of cover some basics. Who here is a finance student? Okay, not many of you. That's great. Um, <laughs> nice. All right, just to begin off with, yeah, those are just some of the stuff you can join that I kind of host. Uh, so how does money work? This is quite an interesting concept to go over because to understand why Bitcoin and all these other digital currencies are quite important, we have to understand how money works, right? And it's strange, despite it being the, you know, the mechanics behind our current society and the entire economy, <coughs> very little knowledge is, you know, spread around people. Um, there was a kind of a video that was speaking about how we have more knowledge about how things operated in the kind of in Egypt than we do uh, about our current financial system. And that for me is quite interesting because everyone should know how it works, right? Like we all work at the end of the day to get money. We're not doing it just for fun. Well, I do sometimes for fun. But that's a different story. Um, so it's important to know how money works. So if you look at this, I guess, you know, how many of you can really look at that and go, yep, I knew that's how it works. That's how kind of current money system works. You know, that's three, let's say, ten people. There's definitely more than 50 people in this room. And that's quite alarming because if you don't know how the money system works, it's quite something that you should think about, right? So how does the money come into our system? What is it that we're actually doing when we exchange these pieces of paper or these digital numbers when we go purchase stuff? And it's very, very important to know this because if you really understand how it works, I mean, it wouldn't take you more than a couple of seconds to go, it's a bunch of bullshit. Um, but that's how, unfortunately how it works. It's all based on debt. And if you were to remove debt, there wouldn't be any money left. Isn't that weird? So entire system works on debt and that's not very healthy, is it? Because for it to continue to grow, you continuously need to loan and lend and you know, th these things need to be part of it, they're the fuel of the economy. So it's to say that our current financial system requires debt to function. 
And that's very alarming because we, we've already seen what happened in 2008, right? <coughs> it wasn't very nice. You know, a lot of people felt the effects of it. And around the world, people felt the effects of it. And it was, you know, a bit more or less depending on where you were, but it had an impact on so many people's lives. So, can we do it a bit better? So, this is just a quick video. Is that it good for us all if a small group of people earn an enormous amount of money? The theory is that their wealth trickles down to the rest of us. But this is a myth. In reality, money is sucked up from all of us into the pockets of a very small group of people. How does this happen? One reason is the way that money is created. Right now, Almost all of the money in our economy is created by banks when they make loans. Now, most people assume that when banks make loans, they're lending out someone else's savings. But they're not. Instead, when somebody takes out a loan, banks create new money electronically by typing numbers into their account. 97% of all the money in our economy is created in this way, as people take out loans from banks. The more loans people take, the more debt there is, and the more money there is. The shocking fact is, if nobody went into debt, there would be almost no money in the economy. Our economy depends on the electronic money created by banks. But because the money is created when people borrow, someone, somewhere, has to pay interest on every pound created. In effect, we are renting the money we need to run our economy from the banks. This means that in the UK alone, together we pay the banks £192 million in interest every single day. And because the debt is held mostly by the bottom 90% and wealth mostly by the top 10%, paying this interest transfers money from the bottom 90% of the population to the very top 10%. It sucks wealth and income from the rest of us up to the very lucky few. So as long as we have to rent the money we use from the banks that create it, we will have to keep paying this huge interest bill, and the gap between the richest and the rest of us will keep increasing. I think if the people knew what the banking system right, is up to, as Henry Ford said, there would be a revolution tomorrow. The is most people think that what a bank does is lend you money that someone else has put in the bank previously. Uh, but what a bank actually does, what a commercial bank does, uh, is to create money from nothing and then lend it to you at interest. If I do that, if I manufacture money in my own home, it's called counterfeiting. Uh, if an accountant creates money out of nothing in the company accounts, it's called cooking the books. But if a bank does it, it's perfectly legal. Uh, and so long as you allow fraud to be legalized, uh, then all kinds of problems are going to pop up in the economic system that you can't do anything about. Private banks create money out of nothing and lend it at interest. Now, that sounds absurd. Uh, when I teach sophomores, you know, about money and banking and how banks, they never believe it. And so you have to go through it again and again. Yes, banks really do create money. They really do. Here's how it happens. And it's absurd, and they're right to, to uh, doubt that that could possibly. <laughs> but yeah, you can look, at the, you look into it yourself. It's quite interesting. Yeah. But that's how your life works. <laughs> if you didn't know that, you know. Uh, moving on. This is quite an interesting documentary. I would suggest you look into it. I won't play it, but it's a Dutch. Uh, it was on Dutch TV. It's called The Banker's Brain. You can find it on YouTube or other locations. And it's very, very interesting to go over the financial crash and why it happened and how the regulations we have in place are not adequate to protect the society from those who take advantage of the society and the people within it. And, you know, he, I think he, he's also an author and he wrote a book about it in Dutch, but I forget the name of the book. Uh, but it's very, very interesting. Anyways, moving on. So that's how the financial world works. And that's what you pretty much go to work to kind of, you know, be a part of. And it's, it can be quite sad, right? Like if, you, if you're working in a system that doesn't have transparency, that you don't know where you belong, it can be a bit confusing. And that's why I really like the concept of 
cryptocurrencies back in 2013, and I was like, wow, this can change everything. Because it's not right to just produce money that's based on debt. When you do that, you put a lot of people into a position to have to pay that debt. And that's not something I want to be a part of. You know, that's not something I've ever wanted to be a part of. I've seen the effects it can have on people. And, you know, when they have to pay the debt, it, you take away their freedom, you take away their choices, they take away, you know, their ability to be calm and make choices that allows them to progress forward because they're so shackled down by that debt. So what if we were to do it a bit differently, you know? What if we were able to decentralize this notion of money production and allow multiple people to do it and do it differently, each with their own standards, set of rules, and allow each indep independent person or uh, eventually even artificial intelligence to set the parameters on how this monetary supply should function within their uh, philosophized uh, society. And that's what blockchain kind of became a very popular notion in this uh, world. And it's really quite strange how it came about at a very important time after 2008 and then released finally in 2009. And it came at a very important time because people saw the repercussions of what happened to the financial system when it was in the hands of a you know, few greedy individuals that did not care how uh, their actions would affect all the people that are <coughs> part of that system. And lack of transparency, corruption, regulation, all of these things play a role in it. It's not just people. I mean, you know, there's so many elements within it. And the financial system can be quite complicated, and it is done so by design. Not many people can look at it and go, oh, wow, I get it. Look, there's all the corruption. It's quite hard to figure it all out. So blockchain is very important because it allows me to look into the transactions and see what's going on in some cases. In other cases, I can't see what's going on, and they have their own purpose. More importantly, it allows you to voice your opinion on how an economy should function. So current financial economy, for example, in the European Union, it allows me to function within it using a fiat called euros. If I don't like it, if I don't like how it's being produced, the people behind it, I don't have another choice. I have to deal with it, I have to use the euros, I have to go by, by all the rules and regulations that are set by the euros. What cryptocurrencies and blockchain allow people to do is say, well, I want it to be a bit differently, I want it to be a bit different, I want to set the rules a bit different. And that's where it became very interesting. It also allowed people to have access to it without pre-authentication, pre-approval. It allows them to have access on it on a global level without saying, well, you don't belong to a state, so we're not going to give you access to our financial system. Tough luck, you were born in a geographical location that didn't have such systems for you. Such is your case, maybe you can apply for a visa, we'll see how it goes. That's not very fair. There's two billion people currently in the world that don't have access to the financial system that we take for granted. And the problem with this is that these two billion people can't go and start a business as we do. They can't go and look after their families and do and interact with the rest of the globe as we do. I mean, I was speaking to a gentleman from Zimbabwe and he said, you take it for granted, but we don't have PayPal in Zimbabwe. We can't use Visa or MasterCard in Zimbabwe. So if I want to order something online, it's very hard for me to do so because I don't have access to these tools. So I have to go, you know, do a lot of crazy stuff just to get to a point where you do with like a password and a click. And that's quite, you know, alarming. And we may live very privileged lives in some countries. I'm sure a lot of us in this room do. But that's not the point here. The point is giving access to people the same freedoms that we have access to. And perhaps in, the country, in a country like the Netherlands, such things may not be as important. Or perhaps it may be, depending on who you are and where you come from. But it's not okay just because you have a good life to say that, well, I don't really care about it. I live a pretty good life. So. Let's look at some facts that actually impact all of us, regardless of where we're from. So these are some statistical uh, information about breach of data, so breach of personal information. And the important thing to note here is that regardless of where you're from, you may have you know, an account with an institution, uh, which could be you know, I, I, iCloud, uh, Google Drive, Dropbox, all these other organizations have had issues because you're trusting them to hold your private files, your information, your you know things that you hold dear to you. 
It could be photos from a holiday, it could be photos of yourself looking in the mirror, who gives a shit what it is? The point is that if it gets leaked, that's not what you gave the, the, the photos to them for. So how can we do it better? Like, what's the issue? When we look at this, you know, what can we see? You know, we see characters like Goldman Sachs, who also took part in the 2008 crash, who are an institution most financial <laughs> advisors will look up to and say, wow, Goldman Sachs, those are the good guys. But they're garbage, really, aren't they? Because if you took a part in 2008 crash, if you help Greece master debt, you're not really doing the right thing within the economy. You know, if you're really at the top of the game, you did not get there by selling scout cookies, you know? You probably did a few things wrong to get there. And that's the whole point. The current system has a filter system, right? <laughs> and this filter system says, well, how corrupted can you be? And if you're more corrupted, the more people, you know, the more things you get away with, the higher you can reach. And that's just ridiculous in my opinion. You can form yourself. So we see a lot of issues here. We see institutions who we have given our trust to, and they have done the wrong thing with it. And it could be alarming for you. This may be the first time you're hearing this. For me, I've grown up with this information. I love looking into this stuff and sharing with people. Because it kind of snaps you out. Things are fine and dandy when you're just scrolling through Facebook and just writing down the road, right? But these things affect our lives, our children's lives, and the generations to come. And it's very important that if future generations look at us and go, what the hell were you guys thinking, you know? Was it, what was it about? What were you trying to achieve? And it's like, oh, you know, at least, at least we got the Lamborghini. Well, that's good. But, you know, that's, that's not really the aim, is it? Prosperity should be kind of distributed among all people. We should all have access to tools and have the choice to be a part of a, such an open system. So these are all issues with our current system. IRS, Dropbox, LinkedIn, you know, internet service providers, even the uh, Netherlands as of 2018 has allowed uh, intelligence agencies to kind of tap into the uh, internet uh, internet data, even in methods by using, by breaking, like doing crazy stuff, and at the same time removing <coughs> referendums as of next year. So you don't even get to, you know, hear the voice of the people that are opposing this. And this may be alarming to you, this may be surprising to you, please look into it. You may enjoy it. So, hack sites are increasing, I'm sure you would have seen this. Corruption is increasing. And all I can think about when I see this, these messages throughout media is like, what can we do to change it? What is the issue here? You know, is it Trump? Is he the issue? Like, if we remove Trump, is the world going to be better? But no, it's not really Trump. And we get, you know, so caught up in these, like, politicians and who's who's who that we forget that they are just an element of the system, right? So it doesn't really matter who you put as your president or prime minister. One, in, one person isn't going to have an effect on changing these issues. So distributed ledger, where do they come from? So historically we've had them. So it's just a method of kind of writing down accounts, right? It's not too complicated. If I had some boxes I could show you. But anyway, it's a different story. But pretty much, imagine you have a ledger with all the accounts information. Instead of it being with one person, your accountant, let's say, and then passed on to the bank, Imagine it being distributed among hundreds of people, and then to a thousand people, and then to a hundred thousand people. So what does this mean? That means if I'm going to edit it, I will need to convince a hundred thousand people that what I want to put in there is legit. And chances are very slim for me to convince a hundred thousand people. Now spread those hundred thousand people and more around all the world, and put them in locations I can't even trace at some time. And it becomes very interesting, because now I have a set of data that has been distributed, not by institutions, but by people. People who want to be part of the network, and they're rewarded by doing so, and by keeping it uh, protected, and contributing to it. And by doing so, I reduce the rate at which a person can commit uh, fraud, and reduce corruption, and at the same time, uh, lessen the possibility of attacks. So if you have a Bitcoin wallet, for example, I may be able to get to your phone, I may be able to change some things, but that's just for you. It would be very unlikely for me to attack the entire network, and that's the point of it. So, yeah, the island of uh, Yapi is quite interesting. So they use this as money, and it didn't matter where it was placed. They didn't really care about moving it too much, but 
this was their money and everyone would agree that all right things have been purchased now this belongs to i don't know, make up a name joe and everyone would come to that agreement and they would agree okay so joe owns that piece of stone now very nice we don't need to move it we all agree uh, there was also an incident, I don't know how true this it is, but there was apparently an also an incident where they were trying to carry one of these on a boat and it fell and it fell to the bottom of the ocean and they were like, well, it's still there, we can't get it, but it's still valid, right? And everyone was like, yeah, cool, it's still valid, it's still there. And that's how it kind of worked, the consensus. The consensus is very important within the blockchain ecosystem, agreeing upon that a transaction is valid and has taken place. And after doing so, it is inscribed within the blockchain, let's say in the case of Bitcoin, Bitcoin's blockchain. There are hundreds of blockchains. There are no, there's no such thing as the blockchain, because there are various forms of it. And each have their own set of standards, rules, principles, and so on. This is where it gets very interesting for me. So this gentleman came out this year, and he said, Bitcoin is a fraud. Uh, and it's quite hilarious, right? But what's the issue here? We all know who's talking crap, but what's the real issue here? The real issue here, just like Goldman Sachs, he's the CEO of JP Morgan, right? And for him to come out and call Bitcoin a scam, when his, his own organization was again in 2008, one of the main characters within the uh, events that took place that led to the crash and the crisis, can come out and say such a thing. And the unfortunate thing is, because he wears a really nice suit and he works for a really nice brand, people may take him seriously, right? They'll be like, well, you know, he's the CEO of JP Morgan. Surely the criminals are in jail. He may not be one. But if the laws were set correctly, he would be in jail with the people that have committed murder, in my opinion. Because what happened after the 2008 crash? It wasn't just money, right? Imagine you had a house, 10 million people lost their homes, and that's not a joke. 10 million people in the US alone lost their homes. Now, how does that feel to suddenly go from having a house to not having a house and you have your family? Where do you live? Many people resided in tents. And that may be cool, just for a few days, it's quite adventurous. But eventually you gotta get tired of it, right? Half a million people, due to not being able to purchase medical uh, medicine and access medical facilities lost their lives. Again, that's not very funny. <clears throat> Yet, if I do a fraction of that, I go to jail. So then what is the issue here? Did I not wear the right suit? Did I not work for an organization that has really nice logo and has like good branding? What is the meaning here? And it may be funny to some of you, but that's how ridiculous this whole society has become. <laughs> because he should be in jail. But yet he can walk around and call Bitcoin a fraud after all the you know, crimes that his organization has committed. And that's our society. And some of you may not like these messages. Some of you may want to pretend like it's all, you know, a paradise. But you have to at some stage make a decision which part of it you want to be, you know, you, you want to put your focus on. So people like that kind of cause issues and they confuse people. And that can be hurtful. So this is kind of how distributed ledgers compared to the traditional systems. So instead of having a central database, so centralization leads to one point of failure. Because if I attack that, it's one honeypot. If I get there, I have access to everything. And it may be like, yeah, we have the best servers on the planet, we have the best server administrations, but hackers don't wait for that. Hackers go after people who just finished a few beers after work and left their laptop at a bar and forgot to sign out. And that's happened many times. Hackers go after people who are like, oh, I want to be cool, I'll show these people like, what I'm working on, and forget their open Wi-Fi environment, for example. And these things take place, and as a, as a result, uh, private information is released, <coughs> and people get access to it. And that's not something I'm really okay with. So we can look at other models, so decentralization versus centralization, uh, in terms of, I guess, how many of you are IT students? Alright, what are you students? Not finance, not IT, what schools do you go to? Just some examples, so I know I'm just making conversation. Uh, uh, no Mainly business, okay. Yeah, don't, don't worry for JP Morgan, eh? Um, I know it may look good on your resume, but 
Yeah, you got to make some choices based on moral values. So, how, how does it differ when we're talking about system architectures in an open source environment versus a closed source environment? I, till this day, say Macintosh, Apple, used to be Macintosh, um, came out and made their software open source, they would take over the entire market because they have such a nice interface. But no, there has to be patents in the way, right? There has to be like copyrights and there has to be limitations and only we can release updates, only we fix them. And this causes issues because then again, you're going back to trusting that centralized issue. Linux is amazing because you can use the same kernel across a variety of uh, situations and you can see all the different examples of it. And allows you to do this because it's open. You can debug it, you can change it, you can modify it, you can do a lot of things to it. And that for me is very interesting, the difference. You allow innovation to take place without authentication again. Just like the internet, I can go create an app for the internet and release it. If people like it, they can use it, right? But when you close something up, I can't innovate. You're stopping creativity. You're stopping my ability to kind of produce and you know do work and, and think of new ways on how I can challenge what you have come up with and maybe make it even better or break it so I can show you what errors you made in that system. And that's very important because someone gave this example as let's say we have Bitcoin, but what if a bank goes in and creates their own blockchain, right? Which they're gonna do. And they have a private form of digital currencies, which will happen and it is already happening. The fiat system is 97% digital. But once this happens, some, Andreas Antonopoulos is a very well-spoken person in this field. He, ha he had a very good example is that you have helicopter parents, right? So in recent times, we have this concept called helicopter parenting, which is that due to the vast amount of information available, parents Google everything, they're like, oh, don't, put, don't touch that, don't put that in your mouth, you know, when, when a child is, you know, a toddler's age. By trying to protect something a lot, you kind of weaken it at the same time. You have the opposite effect. And this has been seen in toddlers. And you'll have the same effect with the money system if you privatize it. So people say, well, public blockchains, you know, we don't want to trust them. Let's create our own one, guys. That, that will be safer. And we will see how this will compete with public ones, right? Because you have to then be responsible for all the patches, all the attacks that take place, all the updates, like everything. You are then solely responsible as an organization or institution or corporation for all the things that take place. With Bitcoin, anyone on the planet that has access to the internet can look at the code and say, you made an error here. Or you can make things better. So returning it back to innovation without approval. And that's very important. I really like storage because it allows you to kind of see what blockchain can do in a simplified manner. So you have Airbnb, you have spare rooms. If you have your spare rooms, you rent it, someone pays you for it, you didn't lose anything, you gained something. The other person also gained something. You don't need hotels, you don't need B&Bs, you don't need motels, you don't need any of these things that were produced for that very purpose. My room has now accommodated someone. My spare house in another country has now accommodated someone. And it's very important because it means that we no longer need to rely on a network that's much smaller. Like if you look at this, this will apply to most peer-to-peer -peer networks. It will apply to most peer-to-peer -peer systems such as blah blah car, such as uh, you know Airbnb, Uber, all these other. But they're not really fully peer-to-peer -peer yet. You still go from peer to a centralized uh, organization called Uber or Airbnb to another peer. But eventually these systems will become straight peer-to-peer -peer and remove the intermediaries. And that's another powerful aspect of blockchain allowing people to connect without going through a middleman. <coughs> and in the case of eBay and Amazon, it means that I don't have to pay fees of 12 to 15% just to purchase something. And if you remove these fees, such as you can do in OpenBazaar, an open source software, that there's no fees involved, it's just software that connects people. And I can go purchase things. You start innovating. You start pushing the economy forward without needing to have intermediaries. That's very powerful. So storage does this with your hard drive. So if you have a hard drive at home, you don't use it, join storage, you can rent it out. And by doing so, you're rewarded in storage coin. Didn't cost you anything. Something that's already there, you share. Peer-to-peer -peer loans, this is a great application of blockchains. 
It allows you to take people that are in countries with very low interest rates. As I said, here we may not care, but there are people on the planet that do care. In Brazil, 52.1% or thereabouts. That's ridiculous, right? So if I want to start a business and I need a loan, that's what I'm facing with, because there's corruption, there's inflation. So what if we connect these people to these people, and Japanese could say, hey, all right, I'll do it for 5%. It's a lot for them, but for them, they've just got like, you know, 10 times uh, lower in interest rates. It's amazing. And all you did was just connect people in different regions. And that's the ability <coughs> to have a system that you can innovate on without pre-authentication approval that's open source, that someone else can take this and say, well, I don't like the way you guys have done it. I want it to be done differently. And that's the power of open source. That's the power it has. So it's a pretty good video, but I think I'm running out of time, so I won't play it. Um, this, for me, is a really good kind of an overview of what's happening. So it shows you how quickly sharing economies, peer-to-peer -peer networks are growing. While many industries in Europe may be slowing down or coming to a halt, peer-to-peer -peer economies and sharing economies are growing rapidly. <clears throat> it's because technology has gotten to a point that allows people to connect with one another without needing to go through a centralized point, without needing to rely on organizations that halt the process of human, human uh, connectivity. That's very important. I like this one. Meshing networks are popping up. So for me, the internet has already become obsolete, right? Um, you may think it's a bit crazy to say this, but it has. You know, we, we're living in an era where we have surveillance monitoring, you know, s censorship, all this, all this crazy stuff going on. Internet was beautiful. It was a place where I could go and access information at will. And now I have to wait for someone else, you know, for, for, for my babysitter to let me know kind of what I can access and what I can't, what's good for me and what's not good for me. Apparently, I don't have my own mind. I do need these people to decide for me, apparently. So it has kind of hindered the whole innovation behind the internet and allowing people to be connected. So meshing networks allow you to collect a large private, let's say, intranet uh, to connect people within that. So it means that you can't have surveillance the way that it is right now, where globally all the information bypasses through you know, centralized points. You can go into countries that don't have access to internet and together as a neighborhood, they get together and purchase one connection and distribute it on a meshing network. You, don't even, you can even remove the internet connection. There's places where they have their own Facebooks, you know? They have their own connections where they share movies and watch movies. You can look into Cuba, they have examples of this. Again, this may not be relevant to you, but it is very fundamentally important for the global push of humanity. An example that I like to bring up lastly is that you know, a lot of people say, well, do we really need these things? Like, what happens if we have these digital currencies and taxes removed, and who's going to build the roads? And everyone's always worried about the roads. Um, and it's important. We do need roads. But truth be told, if you look into it, I can't really speak for the Netherlands, but in Australia, a lot of it comes from private organizations. A lot of the costs of building motorways and highways <coughs> come from private organizations that then on top have a tollway uh, that charge you for that cost of that road. And once the debt has been paid off, they'll do a little bit of renovation to the road and be like, here we go, we expanded it, let's put the debt back in. And it's quite interesting. So if you don't do that, how else can you do it? Well, you can have smart contracts. So smart contracts is a legal agreement done in a code that is lodged onto a blockchain, such as Ethereum's blockchain, <coughs> and allows agreements to take place without anyone being able to tamper with it. Unless you're Ethereum, then you can tamper with it a bit. But in other cases, normally you can't do that. So once you have this, you can have sort of, let's say your salary comes in and you select where automatically some of your pay gets allocated to. And if you don't have a decision to make, like I don't know anything about science, I'll select an advisor to allocate my fund for me to that sector. I'll allocate someone from health to allocate that fund for me. And I can distribute this. So let's say they say no matter what, you have to pay 10%, 20% in tax, 30, 40, whatever it is. But at least I'll have a choice of where these get allocated. In the US, something like half of it goes to war and like, you know, weapon or weapon production, manufacturing. Weapon sales. Sorry? Weapon sales. Weapon sales, yeah. 
Yeah. And that's not very healthy, is it? Live in debt, banks produce money, half my money goes to war. It's not looking too good. JP Morgan CEO is running around, not in jail. It's not a good system, you know? But yeah, it's not much time to kind of go over everything. But the point of it is, these systems are very early, you know? They're very, very new. And a lot of you may be here because you learned Bitcoin boomed in price. It's $8,000, shit. I've got to buy some. And what's the next boom? And what's going to make me the millionaire next? And that's your ideology, that's fine. Maybe look into why that's your ideology, but that's fine. What you should do, instead of chasing these numbers, you know, as I said to a friend of mine, you're just chasing the money. And what happens is when you chase the money and something drops, you will sell it, you will panic. Instead, go within this ecosystem, the cryptosphere, as I call it, and many people call it. And have a look at what interests you, what projects are there that actually reflect with your thoughts, you know? For me, I showed you a couple. There are hundreds of different ones that resonate with my philosophy of how things should be, with my moral values and how things should operate if I was to create a project. And when that happens, it means that I don't care at that point what the price is. I am a part of a network. I take part in the chats. You can go and take, you know, you can be a part of their communication. No matter what organization it is, you can go into their Telegram, Slack, whatever the forum they have, and communicate with them. It's not like Apple where you're like, you can't speak to anyone that's in charge. You know, they have this genius bars, so-called, and that's it. Go and try and be a part of the communities and you will see the difference in mentality. There are a different breed of people that are in these, mostly, unless it's ICOs or something. But, one sec, sorry. They are so different and that's the thing that attracted me the most. You know, like all this information I told you, in 2013 when I got into it, the thing that attracted me the most, I didn't need to tell people these things. I wasn't alone, I was no longer alone saying, but the current financial system is corrupt that we have these issues. People were like, we get it, we already know. Like, welcome home, let's progress and innovate. And that's the most important part of it, that these people already got it. And it has become tainted a bit over the years because suddenly the, you know, the social, the, the culture has changed from, you know, originally people were kind of crypto anarchists against the financial system. Eventually it became about like, oh, Bitcoin's the only one, it's my God, it's my, you know, lover. And then slowly it kind of shifted to now where a lot of people are chasing the money and that's fine too. Whatever brought you here, it brought you here. But my advice for you too is to kind of find out what reflects with you. And if you see issues, it's a great opportunity to find solutions for those issues and innovate. And overall, I personally don't back products that are patented in this field because everything is open source up to now. And if you're important, your idea is so important that you need it to be patented, well, you should take a look at what inspired you in the first place. And if it too was patented, you probably wouldn't have had a project to begin with. So, yeah, um, I hope you enjoyed my conversation. I do want to hear some feedback. If you have any doubts, if you have any questions, if you have any kind of remarks, uh, just to let me know. If you think everything I said is a bunch of bullshit, that's cool too, let me know. Um, but I do want some honesty, like just let me know what you think, you know? And if a lot of it is very fresh and kind of like alarming, that's nice too. But yeah, after me, um, Aliandro will speak from btc.com and they have a nice wallet that allows you to store your private key. This is very fundamental and he'll go over it as well as to why it's important. And yeah, thanks for listening. <coughs> Hope you enjoyed it. Cheers. <laughs>